the desk of the incident commander, brought to you by SecureWorks. Hi, this is Shira Rubinov, and I'm here with Kevin Walsh, Director, Global Incident Command for SecureWorks. Kevin, what a pleasure to be with you here again today. Thanks, happy to be here. So Kevin, lots to unpack today, certainly around cyber incidents. So what would you say is one of the first things that organizations should consider when they think about the start of a cyber incident? Yeah, well, since we always talk about preparation, I hope they're referring to their IR plan to start right away. Yes. Um, but, but there's a couple of things. The first thing that they really need to address is containment. You actually have to contain the threat actor. Now, they have access, or you suspect they have access to your environment. And, and as I mentioned, at this point, you have to address containment. And, and there's a few ways to do this. Um, the first is isolating a host. So if you have a host in question, um, you isolate that host, and depending on the Severity, you may be able to start with just isolating and, and starting your investigation there. Now, now this may not be enough, but it is a very good starting point while you start your investigation to determine what type of incident you may be having. The next, and, and is, is a little more significant, is cutting off all inbound and outbound traffic. Uh, now, this will contain the threat actor, but obviously can have a significant business impact. You know, if you cut off all internet access, you, you do this because of what you know, and you kind of couple that with what you don't know. How is the threat actor getting in? Are there any persistent mechanism that they have that are calling out? And, and with isolation, this contains the threat actor while you actually do the investigation. So it is a, a, a very tough for organizations to do that, but it is the most effective way to contain the threat actor. A, a couple other things, reset passwords, but understand this alone may, be, may not be that effective. It, it, it depends how the threat actor gained access to your environment or if the threat actor again established any other additional persistent mechanisms, but, but it can be effective in certain instances. But please know, especially with global password resets, which can be disruptive, disruptive know that you may have to do this again later on in the investigation. And lastly, I'll just say, most importantly, get help investigating the potential incident. It's so important to understand the scope of the compromise. So either have your team do it. If you don't have a team that's able to do that investigation, please have an incident response team to investigate, to understand the potential of this incident. Well, that's uh, critical information you're sharing. One of the pieces I wanted to bring up that you mentioned was resetting passwords. And I think sometimes organizations jump to do that very quickly before they cut off communication and before they contain. They sit quickly, tell everybody, let's just reset your password so we know that there's no breach in that area. Can you talk to that point for a moment and explain to our audience when is the good time to reset the passwords and why doing it early can actually hurt you? Yeah, well, I don't want it to give you a false sense of security. And, and what I mean by that is if the threat actor has gained access through a vulnerability from an internet facing application and they still have access and they've stolen all your credentials, if you reset your passwords and you think, oh, we're good, they're not gonna be able to get back in, they've actually have all your credentials in because they have another way in. And that's that persistent mechanism we have. And so why we say a global password reset, can be uh, you know, heavy lift for some organizations. Doing it so early and having that false sense of security uh, is what I wanna avoid. Again, in some instances, it can be helpful. I just don't want you to think that that's gonna stop everything. Well, thank you for that. I think that really highlights something that you know, organizations take and say, well, we're good now. And that false sense of security is something that organizations rely on a little too quickly. And you talk about preparation. Is there anything organizations can do to prepare for containment of threat actors when they have an incident? Yeah, well, I just spoke about cutting off all the inbound and outbound outbound internet traffic and, yes. and pulling the plug on the internet is the best way. But as I mentioned, it can be really disruptive and it's a very impactful decision for organizations. I, I mean, think about it. You're potentially cutting off your employees, your partners, your customers. So it's important to understand the impact of these actions. You know, how will it affect your organization, your partners, your employees, your customers? You know, sometimes this will actually completely shut down an organization. So, so the one thing you can do to prepare for this is to identify mission and business critical operations. So 
as I said, we're going to cut everything off to contain the threat actor. But if you identify these mission, mission and business critical operations, and you have those identified and you determine what IP addresses they may need to communicate, what you can then do before an incident is create an established set of firewall rules for these mission business critical operations. And you have that established beforehand. So basically, instead of cutting everything off, you have kind of your set of pinholes that are established prior to the incident. And this is going to allow your business to continue to operate in some capacity. Um, and you also want to have pinholes for your IR firm because you want to allow their tools to communicate and you want to invade and uh, aid in the investigation. So again, we always talk about preparation, but I can assure you that preparation on this part can save your organization valuable time, money. It allows your business to potentially operate while the invest investigation continues. Um, and you really don't want to be going through this exercise at the start of an incident when your hair is on fire and trying to figure out how you're going to allow these pinholes. So if you don't take this action uh, of cutting off the threat actor, and you allow the threat actor to remain in your environment while the investigation is ongoing, uh, going, I can tell you it really can result in tremendous risk and lead to a much more costly and impactful incident. So that preparation of identifying those pinholes really can be beneficial. Well, that's certainly very important what you're mentioning here. That's a massive proactive approach in the cybersecurity posture to even begin with. And it could be a make it or break it for a company. And the way that you're describing, I think organizations should really take heed and understand that this is a massive piece of being proactive in what their plans are. And then we think about what are some of the first calls organizations should consider at the start of an incident? And certainly everything seems that they have to hit it all at once, but they have to get organized. What should be some of the first calls? Yeah, first, what's important is to know your internal processes. So, you know, hopefully, again, you're referring to the IR plan. And, and as I said, we always talk about preparation. Um, you know, as I, I said in the past, when I was with the Secret Service involved with protecting the President of the United States, we took the approach of you can't stop everything, but you can have a plan. And a huge part of that plan is plan, was preparation and training. So part of that in those first calls is knowing exactly who to call. Know who the decision makers are in your organization that'll be making these critical de decisions. Just talked about pulling the plug on the internet, talked about uh, instituting firewall rules. Who authorizes that? It's important to know who's gonna make those calls very quickly and that can really help your organization. Um, as far as externally, there, there's, a, there's a couple of different ones. Obviously, you know, your cyber insurance, uh, outside counsel as opposed to inside counsel, well, in addition to, I should say, outside counsel, especially where we're seeing more and more data exfiltration. So you want to make sure you know your contacts there, your incident response firm. You don't really want to delay in getting started in this investigation to understand it. Know your law enforcement contacts. You know, here in the U.S., especially in business email compromise situations, FBI, Secret Service to help you get that money back. So knowing your contacts before an incident is most important. So knowing who you're going to call and having that contact is so important. Yeah, oh, I can really see that happening. Certainly when things are just going crazy in all different areas and not knowing who's responsible for what. And I think we spoke about that in our last series about knowing who to go to, who are the point people that you need to have lined up for when the incident commander that comes in, they have to know who the hierarchy is in the organization in order to get their job done efficiently. So I love the fact that you are really explaining that to our audience. And what do you think some of the biggest mistakes you see organizations make in the first 24 hours? And I know the first 24 hours is also the most critical time to really do things right. Yeah, I, I have to say, I think the biggest mistake we see is coming back online too quickly. You know, obviously the pressure to restore business after an incident is is an incredible, but I think coming back on online too quickly are the mistakes we see. You know, thinking an incident is limited to one host and just rebuilding that and really not fully understanding the scope of the threat actor activities or do they have any other ways to get in. So it's something that we really harp on of understanding as I talk about all the time, the scope of it. So as I said, coming back on line too quickly is really something we see because as I mentioned, other hosts compromised and things you're not aware of, it's what you're not aware of. And that can lead to re-entry, additional compromise, or, or even worse, data exfiltration or ransomware. And you don't wanna see it take it to that next level. Um, not to harp on it, but talking about, again, people not knowing their roles and responsibilities, lacking those key decision makers who have the authority to authorize the, next, uh, the necessary action. So again, not knowing the key contacts in the outside organization is really delayed thing. And I think that's really important. 
Those, those are good points. So let's flip that question over. Any good actions that you've seen jump out at you? Yeah, we, we actually had a company that we had an uh, instant response engagement with um, that had ended a couple weeks earlier and we were still in, in our closeout process and, and we received alert to, to Tejas RxDR from another host not associated with the initial activity indicating threat actor activity on this host. And, and we notified this client and they took quick action to isolate the host, which, which was fantastic. And as we started the investigation, now we saw additional activity on another host, which indicated some persistence and it was some pretty significant threat actor activity. And based on the indicators of compromise that we had at the time, we advised that they disconnect all inbound and outbound traffic at this time. Now they did this, which was good. And it, it really helped that we had just been engaged with them in an in incident. So they, they really understood the importance of it and they knew who to make those decisions. So they took those actions right away. And now, we always talk about the what if and we always don't always know what could have happened but you know that you want to take these actions anyway well in this situation the indicators of compromise indicated it was associated with a ransomware group that had recently deployed ransomware in just 12 hours after the initial access so the good thing was the key decision makers in the right position helped this company avoid a ransomware incident and unfortunately it's not always the case and others always haven't taken that same action and they have become those victims interesting so i know we talked about you know the first 24 hours being the most critical what are some things organizations can do to make a difference early on if we dive a little deeper beyond some of the things that you're mentioning obviously the, the things you cut off and what you do what are some things maybe internally or within their their organization themselves and their 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 people working within the organizations yeah, the first thing is you're going to want to make sure you're preserving evidence. So if you have logs that are rolling over in a few days, you want to make sure that you're preserving them, anything that you can. This will help tremendously in the investigation, especially when you're trying to determine root cause, how the threat actor got in, what else is, uh, have they have they done in your environments. It really can help protect you in the future when you have that understanding. Uh, also, don't pave over evidence. You know, Make sure your remediation efforts are not compromising your investigation. So if you rebuild a host, make sure you're preserving a copy. You know, Data exfiltration is a huge concern. So what's the plan and how are you gonna react? Because I have to say, it really seems to change the game anytime data exfiltration is entered as a factor. So knowing where your data is stored is really important. Know where your company's crown jewels per se are stored. Um, we had a company that had identified the data was exfilled and, and it was on a folder and the company and, and the name of the folder was billing invoices. And of course that sped wide, spread widespread panic. You know, what's gonna happen now? Do we have all our customer data out? Is all our, our payment information out there? However, it turned out that this was just a folder where they kept our food and service invoices for meeting, no customer data, no financial information, just about food or, uh, order. So it's important to know where your data is. And, and lastly, I'll just say, let your people do the work, you know, give them time to do. These investigations take time. So don't have them meeting every hour with an update, actually have them really uh, have the time to, to do the work. Well, I love what you said, you know, number one really in security is know where your data is, know where it sits, know who has access to it, know what you have. So those are very important points you, you've mentioned. Is there anything else you'd like to add and share with our audience on this topic? Yeah, just take away the preparation. You know, we talk about what happens in the first 24, 48 hours, and we just harp on that preparation of what you need to be doing and understanding that. And make sure you investigate these incidents fully. Don't don't limit it just, just that one host thinking it's an isolated incident. You don't want to turn to something bigger, you know, than it really has to be. Um, and, and knowing who you're going to call, just like we said, knowing who you're going to call right away. And lastly, I'll leave you with this. I know you can't stop everything, but please have that plan. Kevin, that was excellent. Thank you very much for your time. And I'm sure our audience learned a lot from you today. So thank you. Thank you.